Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for February 4th, 2021. I'm Joe Lynch. We are here back with the state delegation update. My guest and co-host today is State Rep Christine Barber. She represents portions of Medford and Somerville. Christine Barber, welcome back. First show of the new year for the state delegation. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me, Joe. I am doing okay and really glad to be here. Excellent. Christine, uh, there was a, a little bit of a break uh, from the state delegation late last year, uh, late November, early to December, because I have a funny feeling that you and your colleagues on the, our delegation were working on this silly thing that we call a budget, a state budget. How did that go? And, and are you fairly satisfied with where we are now? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, we took a break from this program. We did not take a break from the work. So um, there, this, as everyone, of course, knows in every part of their life, 2020 and 2021, these are not usual times. There's so much, um, so much at stake and so much need in all of our communities. So the state budget, as people probably know by now, was delayed. We usually finish it by the by July, by the start of the fiscal year. We actually finished it in more like uh, no, uh, around Thanksgiving. Um, and I think we did okay in the budget. Um, there were a, there was a lot more money we put towards rental assistance, towards shoring up small businesses, towards uh, food assistance, towards um, early education, a lot of the really basic needs that people have had over the last year. Um, a number of us were pushing for um, raising taxes on some wealthy corporations. And we, we had a vote on that. We did not win that vote. Um, there's more that certainly could be done, but um, the budget, we did, we did meet a number of uh, the basic needs that are out there. What ended up happening though was Governor Baker uh, vetoed hundreds of uh, line items in the budget. And because of the compressed timeline and where we were, um, we, I spent you know, Christmas Eve and many other days uh, overriding the governor's vetoes. Um, so he vetoed you know, early education programs, housing assistance, um, a number of programs that were really, would have, are really critical and needed right now. So I am grateful that um, our democratic majority legislature did override nearly all of his vetoes and put that money back in. And we did that right at the end of the year. Um, are you satisfied with what you got or are there more programs that got delayed that you're gonna refile bills for? Yeah, there's, um, I think it was a good down payment as they say, but there is certainly a lot more to do with COVID. Um, and there was a, a lot of activity at the end of the legislative session. So we also, um, passed a lot of bills right um, around the end of the year and the beginning of the new year. Um, so one bill was uh, called Laura's Law, which I think um, a lot of folks in Somerville and around the state may know about, uh, based on a, a story and research that Peter DeMarco, one of my constituents in Somerville, wrote when his wife, Laura Levis, um, passed away outside Somerville Hospital from an asthma attack because she couldn't um, get in the, find the door. The door was locked to the emergency room. Um, so working with Senator Jalen, we did get that bill across the finish line and the governor signed it um, a few weeks ago, um, which will help to improve signage and lighting and help people get into emergency rooms when they have an emergency. So a really important bill that I'm grateful for Peter and all of his family and friends work on. Um, on a personal note, Christine, I just want to offer, um, you know, offer my congratulations to Peter. He never gave up. He never gave up on what he saw as something that was being done in the memory of his wife. So I, I really think that you and the other delegation members who were supporting him, um, I think it may, just may, make his, his memories a little bit more bearable, so. I, I agree that Peter is really amazing. He was like a one person uh, mobilization advocacy group. He himself got hundreds and hundreds of people to make phone calls and to write letters and, 
helped me to make sure that bill was at the top of people's agenda when I would bring it up. Uh, I would hear from my colleagues, oh yeah, I've, I've heard about that. I've been getting calls about that and that's what we needed to pass it. So Peter, yes. Uh, that's how we do it, Christine. Yep. So, so the budget session uh, was grueling like everybody else's. Um, uh, and I think what made it so grueling was the uncertainty. The uncertainty of how the federal budget was gonna work in terms of emergency aid, how the state budget was gonna work, how you were gonna be able to deliver for the municipalities that you represent. So moving forward, we now have, we are still in a pandemic. There is still great need, everything from housing to food to uh, digital divide that, you know, all of the, the, to racial inequality, all of that stuff has been laid bare. How do we, how do we prioritize some of that stuff to make sure it's gonna get done? And I think the key thing that is on the top of everyone's mind is in order to effectuate change, we've got to get back to some semblance of normalcy. And the key to that is vaccination. So you wanna move right into the vaccination part and then we can maybe spend a few minutes at the end of the show talking about your new initiatives. Yeah, um, so I know vaccines are at the top of everyone's agenda right now. Um, and you're right, we um, part, a big part of our recovery is figuring out how do we get back to the new normal and how do we do that safely and making sure we're protecting workers and people who are, um, you know, doing day to day, educating our students, working in healthcare and all the critical things that happen um, that we need to to keep happening. So uh, people probably know there is a three phase rollout of vaccines happening. Um, I will be very frank that I've been uh, extremely frustrated with the vaccine rollout um, and extremely frustrated with the, the job that the Baker administration is doing. Um, we are now in phase two of the rollout where people 75 years and older can get vaccinated. Um, phase one was healthcare workers, home health aides, uh, first responders, and they have been eligible and a lot of them have been vaccinated already. Um, there is a lot more, frankly, that needs to happen to coordinate and work with local communities who know very well how to reach people how to reach seniors, how to uh, make sure people who may not know about the program and may not know how to sign up um, get vaccinated. And that is not happening yet, but I've been working closely with the leaders in Somerville and Medford and um, working with the state to try to push them to coordinate more. Um, so locally here, Christine, I'm sorry, locally yeah. here, we did establish a hotline yeah. uh, for our folks to be calling in and getting the latest status. And I think that was supplementing, um, you know, internet information uh, or public news information. I think it's a great idea, but I, I've already heard back from one senior in Somerville say, but all they could really tell me was the vaccines aren't available yet. Uh, so I, I guess I'm, I'm not questioning what the city did and I don't know what Medford has done. I didn't brush up on that prior to the show. But why would you institute a hotline if you can't administer the product? Well, I think the, the question now is everyone needs information and they need to know when am I going to be eligible? Can I get the vaccine? How do I get the vaccine? It's very you know basic information. And the state, and I'm gonna say the Baker administration has not done a good job getting that information out proactively to people. So we are getting so many questions of, from, for just the basics. When will I be eligible? Where can I get a vaccine? How does this work? Um, so right now, just to walk people through the steps, really only the people who are eligible right now can sign up for a vaccine. So if you are 75 or older, if you are um, a first responder, or and I should have said people in nursing facilities and assisted living have also been eligible for, for vaccinations. Um, so folks who are already eligible can book appointments now. So I think one of the big challenges, is most of us are not eligible and people are, are nervous and wanna know when, when will I be eligible? When can I get the shot? 
other states have programs of trying to uh, queue people up and figure out ways to let them know. We haven't done that. I think that's a big loss and a big mistake and uh, going to make it harder, frankly, to vaccinate people. Do you think the, the state, the, the way that Governor Baker is thinking is that he doesn't want to set expectations because he has no surety from the federal government of how many vaccine doses he's actually going to get? So certainly part of this challenge is the amount of supply and the supply comes from the federal government. So what we just heard from the Baker administration is they've just started getting 100,000 vaccines a week in Massachusetts. That's how many we're getting, 100,000 a week. And they've been told to count on that for the time being. Um, we were getting closer to 80,000 uh, last week and previously. So we haven't been getting enough vaccines. Um, that is certainly part of the challenge. But the next phase is how do you get those 100,000 per week into the arms of as many people as possible and as many vulnerable people as possible. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there is a way to do that and to, to let people know that this is coming. So, so I, guess, I guess it begs the question, you know, I follow the news every morning to see who's getting it, who's not. So one of the one of the um, frustrations that w that I, I'm sure I'm not speaking for Mayor Curtis Tony, but one of the frustrations that I'm sure he's expressed to you and he's expressed to other people is the allocation to Somerville as it stood as of yesterday was only a hundred doses a week. How, how, I don't understand what the Baker administration is doing when they give a city of eighty five thousand people a hundred doses a week. Well, right. Can you help me? No, well, so this has been the broader frustration is that to to me and to some others, I, I'm not sure what the overarching plan is of the for the entire state. It does seem like there's a few mega sites that they have set up that certainly people in Somerville could go to. So now, uh, so Gillette Stadium was the big one. And I, and I was very frustrated when I went on to see where I would to sign up, it said Gillette Stadium, which certainly if you don't have a car, is not easy to get to in, from Somerville. Um, there's a mega site in, in Springfield and then one was just set up at Fenway Park and that a lot of the supply is being funneled to these very large sites. I don't think that's a plan. I think the plan a plan would be how do we make sure that communities who know where people live and know how to get to, to um, get this out to people how are we coordinating? How are we working across the state to make sure we're doing this in an equitable way and getting the vaccine out? Um, many of the locations are not in the hardest hit, the areas hardest hit by COVID. Um, I was just also reading in the paper today about Chelsea, which has been by far um, had the highest numbers of COVID and they have just fought basically from a grassroots level. They had to fight to get um, a vaccination spot. That shouldn't be how it's working. Somerville, uh, Cambridge Medford area should have our own vaccines uh, site and that's not what we've seen so um, right just, and that Chelsea site just opened this morning my understanding yeah. right and it had to be you know fought for like why wasn't the plan okay we're going to really focus on population centers and and where people have COVID where communities have been hardest hit and make sure we we vaccinate in those areas so it is going to be a case of supply and demand. Uh, that's the way I kind of look at this. You know, you have X hundreds of millions of people in this country. Some will not take the vaccine. And that's a discussion for another day. But I think the 65, 70% of this country are ready for a vaccine. Um, how, where is your supply? We're still ramping that up obviously, since they announced the approval, the fast track approval, we're ramping that up. We're trying to distribute that from the federal government level to the state level, to the city level. So between Medford's mayor and Somerville's mayor, I know they are all on calls every day or every other day. Um, would, it, would it be presumptive for us to set in play our own vaccine distribution sites and then just wait for the vaccine to get here. Well, and unfortunately, I mean, no, and I, I think that is what our communities have been doing. You're right. The mayors of Somerville and Medford have great 
local boards of health who have been working incredibly, incredibly hard during this pandemic. And they, they have a plan. They, again, they know how to reach people who are most vulnerable. They have been doing this work in the community. And, you know, we all know our own communities better than the state does. So that is the direction that they're going in. And I, and so the work that I've been doing is also pushing the state and the Baker administration to say, you have experts on the ground, you need to listen to them. And, you know, setting up a site at, at Gillette or Fenway does not get folks in my district uh, vaccinated. So listen to the people on the ground. That's right. That's exactly right. Listen to the folks who the general populace trusts. They trust the people that are in their own neighborhood. They trust their family. They trust their healthcare provider. You, you, does that make sense? They trust their pastor or their priest or their rabbi. I mean, I've seen across this country where states are saying to the community leaders, we need your help. We need you to offer up your church or offer up your soccer field or offer up within the community. It didn't make any sense. I understood the whole logic, Christine, about mega sites, right? It's space. We need to space people out. You need places to keep people warm. You don't want queuing on the sidewalk, all that stuff. I get that. The problem comes in is that if Governor Baker tells me that a vaccine is safe and you can get it out in Great Barrington, that doesn't do me a whole lot of good. I'm going to go to my healthcare provider and say, what do you think based on what you know about me, right? And where can I get it? I would much prefer getting a vaccine in my doctor's office. I would much prefer getting the vaccine close to home. Right. Right. So I agree with you. The plan as it's being rolled out is has uh, severe speed bumps as it's being rolled out. So locally, I think um, I agree with you, you know, that the local mayors, the local boards of health, they are the ones who know their communities best. But people are getting anxious. So we've seen phase one with our first responders. We're seeing phase two in terms of our seniors. One question I've had, and no one has been able to answer it, so I'm going to put you in that category before I even ask the question. How did the arbitrary age limit get decided of 75 and above? What I have heard, but I have not double checked this, is that there were federal guidelines and that for the most part, Massachusetts went along with the federal guidelines, although there are some differences. I know we bumped up um, congregate care settings and um, some assisted living and elder uh, housing. We bumped them up a little higher, but Regar age, regardless of age, right? Regardless yeah. of age. Got it. Okay. Um, because of it, you know, in the state, those communities were just really um, impacted really hard by COVID. Um, but, but, but then that follow-up question, I'm putting you on the spot because you, you, you know that I will do that. Um, so the follow-up question is, okay, so we took care of folks who are in some type of congregate housing that need assistance, whether it's a nursing home or assisted living or anything else. Then you have a whole group, a subset of that age group who live at home. How, how are we getting to those folks? They're not going to take the train to Foxborough. Exactly. How, how do we get to them? Exactly. And that's where we know COVID, COVID has not been equitable, right? COVID has hit certain populations much harder than others. Um, seniors, people who are frail and have comorbidity or other things that put them at risk of COVID, people of color, we know are much more at risk. So that's where this vaccine rollout has really been backwards. I know our Senator Jalen was quoted as saying it shouldn't be like the Hunger Games, where those who um, you know stay up all night on their computer and figure out how to get an appointment win. Um, we should be making sure that the people who are most vulnerable get the vaccine, and that does mean you're right. People who don't have a car to drive to Gillette Stadium but need you know, their physician or a trusted home health aide to come in and, and do this vaccine in a way that they're comfortable with and that's safe for them and, and gets what we need done. 
I love an adventure. I think you know me well enough that I do love an adventure, but I'm not going to get on a crowded train to go get a vaccine. I would prefer to walk in the open air and go to somebody that I trust. So um, messaging is always going to be critical for this type of initiative. Um, you know, I will say with, internally at the media center, we've been talking about messaging to different demographics across the population that we serve on planning. How do you plan to get the vaccine? And we're gonna deliver those messages by people that our viewers trust. So it's not, no offense to elected officials, but it's gonna be people from their community delivering that message, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's exactly right. It's like you said, pastors or other community leaders, certainly people, um, and we're thinking about language access, people who speak um, their language and um, come from their culture and are able to uh, relate to as leaders. So how are we getting the word out and making sure this is uh, trusted and people understand what's happening here? You bet. So I will take you know any morsel of good news so thank you for imparting the news that our dosages are being increased. Hopefully that will translate into uh, no hoarding by certain organizations and just saying, you know what guys, we got 10,000 doses left. Take it to, take it to another community. Give yeah, it to another the, state, the state has also been clear about if you end up with extra, I know there was some news uh, in the last few days about certain universities having extra and not um, I suppose knowing what to do, but that the state's going to take that extra back and make sure it goes to um, the most vulnerable. So to get those doses out and not be stockpiling them. You bet, you bet. So vaccines, they're gonna be critical. They're critical for everyone. I know that there is some pushback by certain segments of the population saying, the whole trial was too fast. We're gonna wait and see. Um, that is not my position. My position is, I wish all vaccines could move that fast in the way that we fast tracked the development and the efficacy of all of these things. Definitely, yeah. Um, you know, third pandemic that I've been through, you know, when I was a kid, it was the polio vaccines. Then came the AIDS epidemic. Now I'm living through the third one, right? Medicine can do wonderful things if they're pushed hard enough. Right. So. Why don't we move on to anything else you want to talk about in terms of COVID related? I know you work very hard on housing, on um, food insecurity, on a lot of the stuff that uh, your constituents are facing. Any updates you want to talk about there? Well, it's a new legislative session, and that means you know every two years we we start over with all of our bills. We passed a number of bills last session. And we're starting over uh, this it, the last couple of weeks, and um, all of the bills, not surprisingly, that I'm filing really are COVID related in some way. It is, of course, the moment that we need to meet right now. Um, so, a couple that sort of come on, link to what we've been talking about. Um, one of the bills that I'm working on, and it, it's a, a kind of a follow up from something I've done, but we've COVID has changed everything, um, is making sure people can afford their prescription drugs. Um, and, you know, we all know the cost of prescriptions is continuing to increase, but COVID really increased the urgency about making medications affordable. Um, so thankfully, the vaccine is mostly covered by the federal government, although some people have some small fees, depending on their insurance. Um, but for people who have asthma, for people with diabetes, it's even more important um, that they can take, they can afford and get the drugs they need. If they're not treating, if people are not treating other underlying diseases, they're much more susceptible to COVID. And we know that this is an illness that's disproportionately um, hit many uh, communities of color and low-income communities. So um, I'm working hard with a lot of groups on the ground, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, which a lot of people in Somerville and Medford are part of, um, have been really helpful in pushing on the prescription drug piece. So we had a, some wins last session and I think we're gonna, we're, we're gonna work for more this session. Um, right. Housing. Housing, any, yes, any, housing is next on my list. Oh, so, you know, affordable housing in Somerville and Med and in Medford have been um, critical issues for many years. COVID 
again, has only made that more urgent and more, um, you know, honestly more dire. So a couple things on housing. Um, in the short term, of course, we need just protections to keep people in their homes. So I'm filing a bill to provide more rental assistance um, to families and make sure they are able to get assistance they need to pay the rent. Um, the, the larger issue, of course, um, is that Massachusetts has local zoning rules that are designed to um, keep certain folks out and keep certain families out. Um, Somerville and Medford have actually done a lot of work in zoning changes over the last couple of years. Most communities in Massachusetts have not. Um, so I filed a bill to update actually the fair housing um, law to stop communities from denying affordable housing developments just because they are affordable. So trying to get more affordable housing in communities that have said no for, for way too long. Um, and this, you know, I think secondarily impacts Somerville because we're doing a lot, but we need everyone to do their part. This has been an issue all across Massachusetts and especially in greater Boston. Um, so I think this is the next step for for addressing housing and, and um, addressing systemic racism and what has been done in a lot of communities. Um, can, I, can I just connect um, the eviction moratorium that we have here still in place in Somerville? Uh, statewide, I think it was lifted, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so that is, I, an, yeah. I would say anybody who has any questions about um, their rights as a tenant here in the city of Somerville, uh, the Office of Housing Sustainability under Alan Schechter, um, they are working 24 seven to keep people in their homes and, and force the landlords um, to not evict people during a pandemic. And they've been amazing at doing that, right. So in Somerville, you cannot be evicted. And um, unfortunately we don't have that protection statewide. Although at the federal level, there's a CDC eviction moratorium, um, which provides some protections. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to do. Which is all the more critical for the small property owner yep. to be given some assistance. If you want them to cooperate and not evict people, some of them have mortgages to pay and bills to pay. So we have to make them whole as well. I always want to give both sides of the equation there. Yeah, and we've been doing a lot of rental assistance, which of course goes to the to the landlord, to the small property owner. And I will say, if you get an eviction notice, please call the city of Somerville. Um, we can connect you with legal assistance. There are, you have rights um, and we can, can try to connect you to get some financial and other support. So um, reach out, there are there is help out there. Christine Barber, you know how fast 28 minutes goes when you get into a conversation with Joe Lynch. I mean, it's just like, some people bang their heads on the table saying, my God, help me end this. Other people say, but it's only, so I didn't say what I wanted to say. Yes. Christine, you are welcome back anytime. Right. State, State Representative Christine Barber, she represents a good portion of Somerville and Medford. Please come back. We'll see you every other week on our new schedule. Um, but for the Somerville Media Center, thank you, Christine Barber. Please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for having me, Joe.